Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, whenever you're watching this online. Uh, thanks for joining us again at Zootown Church, and thank you so much for your continued support of this ministry. And this week, we're actually starting live services again um, at Zootown after the little hiatus from the coronavirus season. Um, and so we're excited to be in person with people. But like I said in my message last week, if you're going to watch this online um, and you consider this your church, I'm going to record my sermons every week, just special for you. So I can look into the camera so it's a little more personal um, and my jokes aren't as good. I'm just going to let you know it's way better in person. Um, but we just want to continue to engage people where they're at. Um, whether work has changed or their life has changed or whatever's changed during coronavirus, we just want to still get the good news out to people. But we do want to invite you in person. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that today as we are launching at 9 and 11 on Sunday mornings at Zootown Church. Um, and we also kind of are shifting gears a little bit with our tribes and our home groups. And I mentioned that last week. And so please go listen to last week's message um, to kind of understand what that's all about. But once again, thanks for joining us. And I really understand that everyone wants an encouraging message and everyone's looking for hope and everyone's looking for direction. And, and I fully understand that and I appreciate that. But um, there's just a lot going on. There's a lot going on in the world. Um, it's just super intense. It's a confusing time. And um, I've just spent many sleepless nights, um, a lot of prayers, listened to a lot of podcasts, a lot of videos, a lot of conversations with people, just trying to discern what the truth is and, and, and what's really going on right now. And, um, and, so, and so I just want to bring that message to you today, just something that's on my heart. This is, this is just something that I've been praying about and something I've been thinking about. And uh, this is just a conversation, really, between us. And, and I, just, I just also want to be clear that, that you know, pastors, they, we don't have all the answers. Um, I, I feel the tension the same way that you guys do. And I feel that something's just not right, like something just doesn't feel normal in all of this. And so um, I, I'm just trying to listen to people. I'm trying to uh, do my own research. I'm trying to just most of all hear from the Holy Spirit on, on what's going on. And I'm taking my time to do that. Um, I'm taking my time to, to say certain things or announce certain judgments um, because there's just so much new information that comes out every day. Um, you know, just even just even the news outlets are just so different in how they're projecting certain things. And so I'm, I'm just taking my time with that. And, and I'm just going to be straight up with you guys that there is a weird pressure right now for, for pastors. Um, there's a weird pressure to say the right thing um, and, and, and what we should be saying. And there, there's literally people telling me what I should be saying and, and what I should be thinking and, and other pastors saying that, that, that Christians and pastors should be saying a certain dialogue or saying these certain words. And, and again, it's tough because I even see discord with believers. Um, we just got camps, we got tribes, we got all types of, of, of different you know, avenues within the body of Christ right now. And so I, I'm navigating this slowly and, 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 I, and I'm, I'm, I'm listening to Jesus. That's who I listen to. And again, I get that it's super weird, and, and I understand that, and I haven't lost hope. And again, I hope to just bring the good news to you today about what Jesus is doing. But it is weird, right? Like, we just went through a three-month, uh, for some of you out of state, it's been longer, of coronavirus, where it literally shut down everything. And, and we had the government telling us that we had to shut down our businesses and shut down our churches. But now we're seeing uh, the government allow millions of people come together in protests. And so it's, it's just a really fascinating, interesting, odd time. I mean, that, that's weird to me that you can tell people to, to give up their lives uh, in their businesses and all kinds of stuff. And then, but you allow, you know, all these protesters, which, you know, they're, 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 uh, most of them are protesting for a wonderful cause, but there just is a lot going on. And it's, it's a unique time to have to navigate as a pastor and, and as a minister of the good news. And I don't know if you've ever read 1984, uh, you know, the Orwellian uh, predictions, but it said this in his book. It says, every record has been destroyed or falsified, every book rewritten, every picture has been repainted, every statue and street building has been renamed, every date has been altered, and the process is continuing day by day and minute by minute. History has stopped. Nothing exists except an endless present in which the party is always right. 
it, it, it feels like that. I know that some of you are feeling this because I'm feeling this and, and the world is feeling this. And I had a great conversation with, uh, with my good friend this week and I thought he just nailed it. He just said, humanity is finally reaching its limits. Like we're, we're, we're coming to a point um, that is obviously tension filled and, and so much going on, but humanity is realizing its limits at this point. And, and I know that this sounds almost um, unfair, or you might have heard it a million times, but to me, what this is just all showing so much is just how screwed up we all are. Um, loss of identity, um, again, tribalism, all kinds of stuff, just how far sin takes us as humans. And this is why we need Jesus the most. This is when we need Jesus. This is when the, the good news needs to go out. And this is proving how much we need God's intervention into our life. I, I want you to know, again, that this is, these are my beliefs that I'm saying. I don't even represent our staff and everything. I represent myself. But I firmly believe that there is a spiritual battle going on, because that's what Paul said. The Apostle Paul said that um, our battle is not with flesh and blood. It's with the principalities um, and the evil forces of the world. And, and, and I know that Satan is constantly trying to cause discord and, uh, again, false identities, and, and it's trying to tear humanity apart. And this includes believers. This includes the church. And he's doing a great job of it. And so I, I do believe in the spiritual battle that's going on, and I do believe that, as I'm going to mention today, that there's a spiritual awakening going on. But the biggest thing that it's trying to do is to get our focus off the kingdom of God. Again, um, I talk to leaders who have, who have no idea, <laughs> you know, who have no idea um, what's going on. And I talk to some who, who seem to think they know exactly what's going on. But just as a church, you know, I've talked to our leaders and our staff, and we really um, consider this a restart for our church. Um, this is a, a relaunch. We have no idea who's coming to our church. We have no idea, um, like, who, who is even living in Missoula anymore, because it's like we haven't seen people for three months. And so um, we're going to be making adjustments on the fly as well, because we just have no idea who's even coming anymore, who's volunteering, you know, whatever it is. And so we're all in this together, that this is a spiritual thing. This is a relaunch um, of, of, of our church, of what Zootown Church is all about. And so within that relaunch, I felt that this is a great opportunity just to show you where we've landed, um, where we're at. And as, as you know, and as you have come, I'm, I'm a grace guy. I'm a grace preacher. That's who I am. And I, I just see it all over Romans, like when, you know, whenever there's, you know, a judgment passage or whatever, it always then moves into grace. And like, like Romans says, it says, as, grace ab as sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. So as we're seeing sin after sin after sin and, and all this different stuff, I know that his grace is abounding all the more. And Romans also says this in Romans 8, and this should encourage all of you watching this today, that... Paul says, so now I live with the confidence that there is nothing in the universe with the power to separate us from God's love. I'm convinced that his love will triumph over death, life's troubles, fallen angels, or dark rulers in the heavens. There is nothing in our present or future circumstances that can weaken his love. There is no power above us or beneath us, no power that could ever be found in the universe that can distance us from God's passionate love, which is lavished upon us through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Anointed One. Amen. This is what we're going to focus on because this is really what we, we, we need, what we think that the world needs right now, that nothing, think about that word, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And I have been saying this for years, and if I'm honest, I've been mocked for it, for saying it for years, that there is a Reformation coming, and the Reformation is here. And it's more than just theology. It's more than just recovering things from the past. It's more than just the tension as we talk about um, different viewpoints on things, but there is a, a spiritual awakening going on in the world, and it's going to start with the church. It's starting with the church. Peter said judgment starts with the house of God. 
And so there is a spiritual reformation that's going on right now, which is why we need to be more and more aware of, of what God is doing. We need to be more focused on the Spirit. We need to be, be listening with our spiritual ears more and more and more because it's not just coming, it's here. It is, it is causing change within the church, and, um, and, and we want a beacon to be a beacon of unity within that. And I understand that it's so dark right now, but I can tell you the dawn is coming. And we are to be salt and light to a weary world. A part of this reformation is as we look, we start to re-examine traditions. We, we, we examine our fears. We look at our egos and we just simply trust what Romans 8 says. That nothing will separate us. That the darkness will not overcome the light, as Jesus said in John. That nothing is going to stop what God is doing through this whole season. And so this is where we are at at a church and as a church, and this is where we are at uh, as your pastor. And I've been saying this for years, that this is coming and it's here. Again, I also know that if we are going to make a difference, I believe that we first need to return to the Lord in a lot of ways, that we need to take a, a step back and look at ourselves, our own judgments, the, our, our, our own blind spots. And this is where the spiritual awakening will start. And, and as I, I've said it the last few weeks as well, we need wisdom more than ever. We need to be able to discern truth, right and wrong. And we need to be able to go where Jesus is going. We need wisdom. And it's so easy to sit back and, 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 and judge people first or, or cast judgments on things or, or constantly look at everybody else. But I'm here to say, you need the wisdom of God right now. You need to be seeking the Lord. You need to have your spiritual ears open because there is a ton of information and there is a battle going on right now. I want you to know as we re-examine our traditions and as we look at how where church is going and, and, and we are in the middle of this spiritual reformation, that means if we're going to follow Jesus, that means it's going to cost us. And that means we might be on the outside of certain things that some churches are doing and some churches are going or society in general. And that means we're going to have to go against the grain. And I'm here to tell you that we have to as Zutan Church and I have to as the pastor. I have to go against certain things, and I have to be aware of what Jesus is doing in the midst of all this darkness, and we have to be aware of this battle that's going on. And so let's pray. Father, we, we need your wisdom. We need our spiritual ears wide open. We need our spiritual eyes able to see in this season. And so please, Lord, we humble ourselves before you, and we just ask for your wisdom to seep into our minds, seep into our hearts. And I specifically pray for Zootown Church that anyone who attends or anyone who's watching online, that they can just you know, filter through the, the, the false things, the dark things, the things that are trying to take them, uh, take them down the, the wrong road, and that we see truth and light. Give us wisdom, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Again, I'm a... I'm a grace guy, and I see God as, as a redeemer. Um, and I, even though I'm a grace guy, I can tell you I have never believed in the sovereignty of God more than I do right now in my life. I have, my faith has grown exponentially, not only just in the last three months, but in the last couple years. And I believe that God is completely in control. And, and when, I, when I say that, I'm, I'm not a Calvinist. I don't believe that God is just pulling the strings and making people do certain things That's and picking and choosing, whatever. I, I don't. I think we play a major role in this. I believe that God allows his children to write the story. But I also believe that God is there you know, like I said one time, just the bumpers with, with the, in the bowling alley, that he is in complete control of this, and he is working in the midst of this, and he is a redeemer. That's who he is. As I have now looked at the scriptures, and then I see them different, because now I look at the scriptures as the whole story. I see it from front to back. I don't just look at one little verse. I see the whole redemptive story. I see that is who he is. He is a God of redemption. From Genesis 1, what do you see? You see God, man, and creation, and you have two trees. And then go all the way to Revelation at the very end, you see God, man, creation, and two trees. And right in the middle of that, 
right in the middle of the, the story, the human story, the God story. There's turmoil, there's fighting, there's war, there's genocide, there's sexual abuse, there's all types of things. And in the middle of the story, you see another tree where God hung and he showed us who he truly is, a redeemer. And that tree still stands. The cross still stands. As that's why I preach that God has already defeated everything, that Jesus holds the keys to death and Hades. That is the redemption story from Genesis to Revelation. Again, seeing God as a redeemer has helped me read the Bible differently. Because again, now I don't just do um, uh, bits and pieces I, I see everything differently, and I see the scriptures differently. And more than ever, I believe we need this bigger lens. We need this bigger lens of what is going on right now. We can't just read one article in the news. We need the bigger redemption story of what Jesus is doing and where Jesus is taking us as a church and as a humanity. So and you, you start in, a, um, in Genesis, and, and today I'm going to take you on a journey I'm going to show you what that means to see the bigger picture, the redemption picture. And what you see it, when, you, when you kind of step back and see everything with a, with a new lens and a bigger lens, you see this amazing control and redirection and ultimate redemption that the Father always does. And so today I'm actually going to take you on a little journey through the entire Bible. So we start in Genesis and we read a story about a flood. And if you grew up in church, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Remember, and this is so weird to think about now, that you, you'd go to children's church and you would see these paintings of Noah and paintings of the flood. And now you're like, why in the world would we put that in you know, children's church? And I get it because of the animals and the zebras and all that stuff. But you know when you read that story, it's not just about rainbows and olive branches. That was a moment that God was um, you know, not just you know, destroying certain things, but he was also redeeming certain things. And within that story, we meet a guy named Noah. And Noah obeys God for a long time. And he, as he obeys God and he builds the ark and people mock him and he gets on the ark, he literally was to restart humanity. But then you see that Noah, in that story, makes some wine. Now, they were new uh, in that day and age to the old cheese board and, and wine tasting thing. And so you know what Noah does? He gets completely smashed. Yes, the chosen one of God, the guy who was going to restart humanity, got completely loaded. And so loaded, again, we need to ask those questions. Like, that's kind of an interesting part in the Bible, that if, if this guy was, uh, you know, the one who was going to restart everything, like, what, how, how pure was he, actually? But then you see, as he got so drunk, his son uh, finds him naked. His son Ham, and he goes and tells his his brothers, and then they go and they 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 cover their father's nakedness, and it's it's a really vague passage of what's going on there. But Noah is so upset that he felt like his son was shaming him. He puts a curse on Ham's family. He literally curses his bloodline. Now back then, and even today, a curse from the father was a really big deal, because uh, uh, out of a family, like if if you. Um, were cursed, not only were you kicked out of the family, but that curse rested upon your family forever. Now let's pause here. The family who was supposed to be sinless after sin was supposed to drown out or be drowned out by the flood now was divided forever. Think about that. We were, we were, uh, he was supposed to be the guy, the chosen one, the pure one. And now he, uh, before, you know, any more humans were even there, he cursed his family and the family was divided. Just like today. Just like today. Jesus Christ, he came. He showed us the redemption. He showed us the story. He showed us. And not only is the world divided, races are divided, politics are divided, churches are divided. What's going on? So again, you keep following the story. Ham had a son named Sidon, and the family curse came with Sidon with his pacifier. The minute he put his pacifier in, the curse went with him, and there was nothing that that kid could do about it. Well, God allowed Sidon to have many, many children, and eventually these children um, became a nation, and they were called the Sidonians. So even though Noah put a curse on him, God still blessed him. And they became the nation of the Sidonians. But that curse never went away. 
that curse was something that was put on by his father. And so now you have this entire nation, this entire people group who is considered cursed. Keep going in the story. Fast forward to Judges 10. And now you find that the Sidonians were actually oppressing the Israelites. And this means now that former family members were now being oppressed by each other who came from the same bloodline, the same father, was now going against each other, and the Sidonians were causing persecution on the Jews. Let's pause again. It's interesting that one curse from one father for the entire human race can then boomerang back on the person who gave the curse. More interesting is how this wound, that's really what it was, it was a wound from his father, started with Noah and Ham and then affected generation after generation after generation. The interesting thing again is, is at the Israelites in, in Judges 10, they had nothing to do with what Noah did. They didn't cause the curse. They weren't there. It was, it was you know, thousands of years later. Yet war broke out because of something that happened you know, years later that they had nothing to do with. Let's pause again. My dear brothers and sisters, I know that there's a, a war going on right now. And I know that there's a lot of ins and outs to this war. But my friends, we, as the American people, we enslaved black people to start our nation. And segregation was not that long ago. So 100 years after the Civil War, there was still segregation, and that was only 50 years ago. Now, I understand that you had absolutely nothing to do with that. And I, and I empathize with that because, again, I had nothing to do with that. But don't you see how the sins of former fathers can boomerang and affect things today? The same way Noah casting a curse onto Ham, then boomeranged back on them years later, is the same way that we live in America and our so-called Christian nation, our, you know, our father, forefathers had slaves. And it boomerangs, and now it is affecting our life today. We need to take this seriously. But not only that, I want you to see that this, what you're watching today is it's the human story. Think about this. The Jews were enslaved by the Egyptians, and the Egyptians enslaved them so they could build their nation. So then God comes and releases the Jewish people, and what do the Jews do? When the Jews get out, they enslave people to help build their nation. Fast forward again. Our, our forefathers of the Americas, they fled persecution and they came to America, and what did they do? They enslaved other people to build a nation. We're watching this boomerang effect over and over and over. This is the human story. One curse from one father. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you heal our father wounds. We pray, Lord, that you heal um, the African communities wounds, all minorities' wounds, and our wounds too, because we're all wounded. We ask your forgiveness for false judgments that we've made on people. We ask your forgiveness for insensitivities that we've had, and we pray that you heal our wounds and let this cycle go on no longer. In Jesus' name, amen. So the story goes on. King Solomon then would take many wives. Not only would he take like 700 and some wives, he would take hundreds of concubines. Basically, they were women slaves who had to meet his sexual needs. Now, Solomon was King David's son. Solomon, they said, was the wisest man who ever lived. He is one of those guys who's almost like our hero of our faith, yet he had all these wives and concubines. Now, again, let's pause. My dear brothers and sisters, why do we show Solomon so much grace? Why is he a hero of the faith? Why? Why do we show him that much grace? Why do we, we study his Proverbs? Why do we take all his advice when we see that this man, was he really like this godly, godly man? Well, because he was a part of God's chosen people, we say. Well, one of his wives that he took was a Sidonian. Now remember, you've got to keep tracking it here. Ham gave birth to the Sidonians. 
And then they became enemies of the Jewish people because of one curse. But he takes a wife in, and she ended up leading him to worship uh, Ashtoreth, who was one of their, her, their goddess. And so Solomon, this godly man, ended up marrying a Sidonian and ended up worshiping false gods. Again, let me ask you, if he was worshiping false gods, do you think Solomon went to heaven? Was he a, was he a godly man? Again, my point is, is that we show our founding fathers of our nation a lot of grace. And I actually do, and here's why, because I do think a lot of things are cultural, that if I was born there at that time, I don't want to say that I too wouldn't have given into that mindset of having slaves. But can we honestly say that there were these upstanding Christians if they had slaves? You see the timeline, see the timeline, see the timeline. The story goes on. In First and Second Kings, Solomon has a great-great-grandson named Ahab. And Ahab marries a Sidonian woman. And her name was Jezebel. Needless to say, Jezebel was, uh, she was trouble. <laughs> she was trouble. And she ended up trying to kill, she did kill, many of Israel's prophets um, until she met her match with Elijah. Yet, the curse of Noah lives on today. I have heard in Christian communities, when some woman is trouble, we call them Jezebel. We, we never call, when a guy's trouble, we never call them Solomon. When a man's a rapist, we don't ever call them David. See how sometimes our, our, our view is skewed of right and wrong. Sometimes our view is skewed of who our heroes should be. But you see the bloodline of the Sidonians going and going and going. Again, I want to be very clear that what Jezebel did was evil, and there is real evil in this world, and there are things that are just absolutely atrocious and disgusting, yet we can trace it back to one curse from a father. Finally, the story continues to go on, and we see uh, the prophets, we see Isaiah, we see Jeremiah, we see Ezekiel, and they all love talking about judgment. They love talking about judgment of Israel's enemies, and may I say we do too. Grace is cool, right? I mean, we like grace, but we can never talk about grace unless we talk about wrath. Like, we have to, we have to always include wrath with grace because, because wrath is where it's at. The problem is that the, the prophets never really just stopped with uh, the, the, the enemies of God. They would call out the Jews themselves because they would say, you're doing the exact same things. And so we see the prophets come on the stage and we see them announcing judgment over the Sidonians. But yet, their own people were doing some of the same things. Let us pray. Father, please forgive us when we have not stood up to evil. Father, please forgive us when we've been afraid and we've just given into culture things that are absolutely evil. Racism, abortion, murder, all kinds of things, Lord. Forgive us when we've just become desensitized to these things. But Father, just like many of the Israelites missed that they were just as bad, Lord, forgive us in our own lives. Forgive us in our own lives, Lord. Forgive us when we have cursed people, nations, skin colors, instead of bless them. Forgive us, Lord. Amen. The prophets would predict all the coming wrath of God against the Sidonians. Every one of them, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, they, they predicted that God was going to wipe out the Sidonians, the hated Sidonians, the cursed Sidonians. You see, the Jews were the good guys. They were in, but the Sidonians were out. End of story. Until Jesus. Jesus shows up on the scene. And it was this time in history where it had gotten so bad. There was so much hate. There was so, many, uh, so much wounds, so much divisions that the Jews wouldn't even talk to someone from Sidon. They wouldn't even talk with them, let alone go hang out with these people. See, that was their tribe. They were the bad ones. This was the Jewish tribe. They were the good ones. Again, fast forward today, we have our tribe. We're the good ones. This tribe is the bad ones, and we miss everything Jesus is doing. So Jesus comes on the scene, and in Matthew 7, excuse me, Mark 7, it says this, 
And from there, he rose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Let's pause again. How do you think the disciples reacted to this? How do you think they reacted when when Jesus walks into this town? This hated Sidonians, the evil Sidonians, the one that their, their guys, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, all said God is going to destroy these people. God loathes these people. They're the worst of the worst. They are cursed before God. How do you think these disciples were feeling? Now, again, let me, let, me, let me make this real for us today. Because when they saw Jesus sit down with this woman, when they saw Jesus actually even go into this town and talk to these people, again, let me ask you, what, how would you think if you saw Jesus walking with these protesters? What would you think about that? What would you think if you saw Jesus sitting down next to President Trump and, and having uh, you know, a, a drink with him, coffee with him, and counseling him on what to do? And the bigger question is, is where would you be sitting? Because that's where Jesus is sitting. Would you be there in this story? Would you be there with the Sidonians if you were a Jew? Would you sit next to the Samaritan woman that Jesus did if you were a Jew? And which guy would we be in, myself included, in the good Samaritan story who were also hated by the Jews because they were not a part of their tribe? Verse 28 says, Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. This hated group of people that no good could ever come out of them. And not only that, God's going to bring the hammer down on them. Jesus does the complete opposite. He goes and meets with them. He sits down with them. He talks with them. He heals them. Let us pray. Father, please help us see where we're sitting. Please let us see if we're sitting in the wrong spot. Please let us sit with people we don't agree with. Please let us sit with people that society has deemed cursed or the church has deemed too sinful or too wrong or too messed up. Forgive us when we weren't willing to sit with those people. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this story just keeps getting better or worse with how you're feeling right now. Because when you go over to the book of Luke, you see that a bunch of people came from Sidon and they decided to follow Jesus and become his disciples and he heals them. And to the disciples' dismay, they still can't figure this out because no, they are the chosen people. They are the ones that, 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 um, you you know, God came to save while they are judging these other people. And Jesus could give a rip about the past. He could give a rip about judges where they were fighting with the Jews. He could give a rip about Ham, uh, you know, uncovering his father's nakedness. He could give a rip about Jezebel. He goes and he says, follow me. Because he's about the future. Do you see the pattern in this story with the Sidonians, starting with the father's curse? Gets even better. So then Jesus sends out 72 disciples But he sends them out to only Jewish towns. And why? I think he knows that that they're not ready to hang with real sinners. Again, that's why I think when he went and sat by the woman in Samaria, he made them go into town to get food because he's like, they're going to ruin this right now because they hate these people. And so what he does is he throws them a bone. He says, okay, go to, your, go to the Jewish towns. Go to, go to your brothers and sisters and announce to them the good news and heal the sick. But he also did this to teach them a lesson about who you think the good guys are and who you think, uh, God, whose side God is on. Because their own people denied this message. They denied that the disciples had a different view of who the Messiah would be. So the chosen ones, the ones with the right tradition, the ones with the right religion, the ones with the right theology, missed their own Messiah when there was a spiritual movement in their midst. I know I'm getting fired up right now. 
but we need to take this incredibly seriously as Christians. You know when Jesus said, he said the only unforgivable sin is denying the Holy Spirit. We always think that's receiving Jesus. If you read that whole passage and you read the Greek and you read the nuance in that, what he's actually saying is, if you deny what the Spirit is doing in your midst, if you deny the movement of God by your tradition, by your religion, by your prejudices, by your politics, whatever it is, and you miss the movement of the Spirit right in front of you, there is a spiritual movement happening right in front of us. And so, listen to what he says to these Jewish towns. Woe to you, Sherazin, Woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, the Sidonians, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? No, you shall be brought down to Hades. The reason I'm going through this timeline, the reason I'm showing you the, the extents of Scripture, because what if you stopped in the Old Testament and you said, see, God hates these people, and God is going to bring wrath on these people. You know what? Those predictions never happened. God did not do that. Instead, Jesus came and he showed us that the people that we view as cursed and the people that we view as outlaws or sinners or messed up, he is the one where he is going to heal he, cares, he could care less what religious people think with their traditions and their opinions and all kinds of stuff. He could care less. And if we look at a closer view, what he's really saying is it's better to be a Sidonian than a devout religious person who thinks that they got it all right. I want to show you what I did here. And this is going to shock some of you. I mean, that... Let's just be real. That's pretty sweet to go from the whole timeline of the Bible to see one curse from the Father and just, just follow the trail and then see Jesus, how he goes and saves them. That is incredible. And I did that to show you the bigger lens of God in the redemption story in the midst of awful, evil, confusion, religion, death, just like the Romans were doing, political strife, everything that was going on. He is a redeemer. That's what he does. But I also did this for another reason. Because you know where I got all that information from? A book by Rob Bell. Yes, that Rob Bell. The one who was excommunicated from the church by people who never even read his book. The one who, who had tweets written about him, who, definitely do, who literally got kicked out of the church community because he had a few different views on hell than evangelicals, amongst other things. I did this on purpose. Because here's the point. The church has an incredible opportunity right now to be a part of this spiritual awakening and be a part of the solution instead of a part of the problem. But I'm going to tell you this, and I'm not just talking about our church. I'm not talking about any individual at our church, and I am wrapped up in this as well. But we are just as tribalistic. We are just un, as uninclusive. We are just as closed hearing as the rest of the world, and we should be leading the charge. I did this because I knew that if I even mentioned Rob Bell's name in the sermon, you would have immediately shut off your ears. You would have immediately discarded everything he said. Even if I just said his name, you would have tuned out everything that I just said, even though we know that that is true. That's all we did was walk through it. I have seen this with many authors. I have seen this with many speakers, with many pastors, whomever, because we want our views, we want our traditions, we want our safety nets, we want to sit in our tribe. And so all we have to do is name a certain name or name a certain group or whatever, and we instantly close our ears. And that is the problem in the world right now. Nobody is listening. Everyone's afraid. I have major disagreements with Rob Bell. But what he said here is true. And we can learn from it. And we need this kind of understanding right now in our world. And if we are going to throw out everything 
that people say, and if we're not going to listen to anything people say because we have some disagreements with them, then we will fall into the same trap that the Jews fell into and what humans are going through right now because they branded a whole country, a whole tribe, a whole movement cursed by God, and they missed what Jesus was doing in their midst. And right now we are branding whole movements, whole people, whole tribes, whatever it is, as cursed by God, and we're the good ones, and we're not listening, and we're missing what Jesus is going to do through this midst. We are in a dark period. The light, the darkness cannot extinguish the light. John told us that. Listen to what Rob Bell goes on to say. So what do we learn from the Sidonians? There's an interesting thing Jesus says after the part about the day of judgment. He says that God has hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. In a highly religious culture like the one Jesus lived in, people held their views and convictions and loyalties with clenched fists, kind of like now. Stories about who had God's favor and who didn't, who was cursed and who wasn't, held tremendous power. But according to Jesus, God is interested in something else. How open are you to what the Spirit is doing in this moment? How receptive is your heart to a fresh word about grace? Are you hungry to learn, to grow, to be transformed? Do you want to see things in a new way? Because if that's the desire, it doesn't matter where you're from. Should we kill our enemies? Well, Jesus said to love them. Should we make judgments about who is in and who is out? Well, whenever people did, Jesus quickly and decisively acted to include whoever had been excluded. What about that curse that was so important to Jesus' tribe for so many years? He invites his tribe to leave it behind. He does this often, challenging his tribe to think about things in a new way, and he still does today. My brothers and sisters, did you notice when Jesus was talking about judgment, he says everyone's going to be judged? It wasn't just the Sidonians. It wasn't just the Jews. It's us as well. And if you can't and I can't sit down with ones we, we disagree with or we think people are cursed by God, we will just go to our tribes, we'll pat each other on the back and think we're free and clear from judgment, and we're not. We're not. My friends, we will all be wrong about things. I know this is an incredibly confusing time, and I know people are telling you to go this way or that way. We're all going to be wrong. And what this time is showing us is how messed up we are. But even when we're wrong, let's be right about love. The same love that Jesus showed the Sidonians. My friends, our world is wounded. The Sidonians were wounded for thousands of years because of one curse instead of a blessing. I am wounded. You are wounded. Our country is wounded. Minorities are wounded. And there is an awakening happening right now. And many things are going to be revealed. And God is going to win this battle. But the question is, which side are you going to be on? Are we going to continue to divide and yell and be angry and scream? Or are we going to choose to listen, to observe, and to pray and be aware of what the Holy Spirit is doing in our midst? Again, just give me a second just to share my heart. I just see so many people online, even pastors saying, you pastors should be saying this, and then you guys should be saying that, and you should denounce this, and you should denounce that, and you should raise this group up, but not raise that group up. And I am not going to do that. Because I want to have the Jesus lens that the Sidonians, the Nazis, the black people, the white people, whatever it is, Jesus is going to them. You know, again, I, I, and this is just my opinion, even like I hear people being like, yeah, black lives matter. They do. And then people say, yeah, but all lives matter. Just let them have their moment. Let them have their moment. Of course, all lives matter. I get it. But I think the best meme I saw, the best thing that, that explained this is that's like going to a funeral where someone's child has died and they're talking about how much they love their child and you walk up and you grab the mic and say, yeah, but all children matter. Of course they do. It's not helping. Let them, have their, let them have their moment. 
But even again, I see Antifa, right? Antifa is bad news. They declared it a terrorist organization. They should. It is a terrorist organization. But I'm here to tell you, Jesus is in the middle of Antifa. Those are lost, wounded, angry people. And those people, Jesus, you're going to hear stories of, of, of Jesus redeeming those people. And then I hear people telling me that, you know, you know, we got to stand up for this, but, you know, we, we got to put down the cops. I'm not going to do that. I am not going to put down one group to raise another group up. And I got a lot of cop friends. And is there bad cops? Yes. There's bad pastors. There's bad lawyers. There's bad judges. There's bad teachers. Because we're all screwed up. And we all need Jesus. I'm, I'm all about reform. I'm all about it. It is disgusting to see black people die. I'm all about it, but I, I, I'm not going to put one group down and raise another one because Jesus didn't do that. He didn't do that. He called everyone out on their BS. Because what we can do is we can lead people further away from the spiritual awakening that's happening right now. And I want to be like Jesus. Let us pray. Lord, we pray for ourselves. We pray for our own wounds. We pray for hurting people. We pray that we can be uniters. We pray that we can stop branding people certain things and going to our little tribes and patting each other on the back and causing fear and panic. Let us be Jesus, people. Let us stand up against evil. Let us stand up for justice. And let us not fall into anything we're not supposed to fall into. Let us sit down with our enemies. Most of all, let us be people of compassion. People of compassion. In Jesus' name, amen. I just want to conclude with this. This actually is in my series, The Thing Behind the Thing. Because right now, with all the chaos going on, there's a thing behind the thing. And there's a spiritual awakening that is happening. And in Matthew 13, because this, this series is about the parables, it says this, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. And he says again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. See, I have heard a lot of sermons saying, see, this is about us, like giving up everything for Jesus. This is about us. This is not about us. This is about God because God is sovereign. This is God's world. And in the midst of all this chaos, he has already bought humanity with his blood. He has already defeated evil, death, and Hades with his blood. And he is working and he is working. And yeah, the pearl seems hidden right now, but it's not. He is working. And I love how it just says even one pearl, that if you, if, if you were the only one on the planet who would follow Christ, he would still go to the cross. This is about God who says, I am going to purchase back with the most precious thing in the world, my own son. I'm going to buy back the world. The world is his and the fullness thereof. And their enemy is not going to win this battle. It's if we're going to align with what Jesus is doing because Jesus says the gates of hell will not prevail and they will not prevail in this time in our life. Look at this amazing picture of people coming to know Jesus and getting baptized in the midst of the protests going on. Jesus is working in the middle of this. And we have to decide. We have to decide how we're going to act, how we're going to behave, and who we're going to include. My friends, I do not have all the answers. And I do believe there is a major deception going on right now in a lot of different areas. And it's just Satan's schemes trying to disrupt God's plan, and it ain't going to happen. All I know is I want to follow the Jesus model. All I know is I want to be like Jesus, and I want to invite you to do the same. All I know is all I'm seeing on TV and on social media is a bunch of wounded, messed up people, and there is a spiritual awakening happening in our midst, and I want you to be a part of it. And so I end with Romans 8 one more time. 
So now I live with the confidence that there is nothing in the universe with the power to separate us from God's love. I'm convinced that his love will triumph over death, life's troubles, fallen angels, or dark rulers in the heavens. There is nothing, nothing in our present or future circumstances that can weaken his love. There is no power above us or beneath us, no power that could ever be found in the universe that can distance us from God's passionate love, which is lavished upon us through our Lord Jesus, the Anointed One. Rest in that, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.